I want you to turn your Bible with me to Psalms chapter 150. What I was going to say is that I think there are times where we want to bring things up to God, to remind God of our failures of the past, to ask God to forgive us over and over and over and over again of the things that he has already covered by the blood of Jesus. If you've asked him to forgive you and you were sincere, if you've asked God to to cleanse you and set you free. He's done that work. You don't have to beg or plead or pay or do anything else. Just accept what he has said by faith, trusting that what he has said is enough. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. We love you guys. David and Sylvia are, are also work in uh, the chaplain's office in prison and do a phenomenal job. We appreciate so much. Sharing the light of Jesus with people who need that light desperately in their lives. Talking about stress this morning, I'm not going to ask how many of you have stress. Some of you may think you're in the 915 service. You are not. It is 1045. You missed the 19, 915 service, but that's okay. You made it here today. And perhaps the right time to talk about stress is when there's the greatest amount of stress. And the truth of the matter is Christians are not immune to the pressures and pitfalls of life. We deal with these things in our life as well, every single day. And there are things that generate stress within our life, and some of these things we have control over. And I would tell you this morning, whatever you have control over, take control over it. You, you're not a pawn. You're, you're, not a, you're not one of those faithless people that is tossed like the waves of the sea. You, you have a strength within you that is not your own. It's a strength that comes from God. But let me just give you several of the things that can cause stress and innumerable, numerable things. But let me just suggest when you're overtired, which probably many of you may be today, I look at your faces and I can see some of you just lost an hour of sleep and you know it. When you're overtired, well that's, you know, that's something we can control. Don and I went to bed last night at 8 o'clock at night. You know why? because I knew I was going to lose an hour of sleep. And then I was going to have to get up here and preach three messages this morning. Do, do you know that research says that preaching a message is like running a marathon? So I have run three marathons today. I don't know if that's true, but I believe it. When you're sick, sickness can create stress. But can I also tell you, stress can create sickness. When we're outside of our safe or familiar surroundings can create stress. When we've taken on too many responsibilities. Can I just tell you something? There's a word that every, two words, that every person needs to be able to be, uh, to use on a regular basis. Two words, simple words. No. Say it with me, no. Did that hurt? Nobody had pain, no. <laughs> Nobody had pain by saying no. But there's another word we need to learn how to say often, and that is yes. Yes. Our first reaction should not be no, but our first reaction shouldn't necessarily be yes. Now, when God tells you something, our response ought to always be yes. But you know, there are times where we take on responsibilities that we don't need to be taking that we don't have the capacity to do. And can I tell you, there are some things that you have to let go of before you can take something else on. Amen, Pastor Steve, that was very good. Amen. Praise the Lord. During times of grief and tragedy, when our circumstances seem to spin out of control, when we feel threatened or anxious, oftentimes it adds or complicates the stress in our life. And I know there is stress here today, and so I want to alleviate your stress. I have a prescription that I want to share with you that will alleviate your stress. Now, now let's get ready. Uh, get ready to smile, okay? In fact, everybody, let's rehearse. Smile. Oh, some of you, it looks like you're in pain. <laughs> Cheerful heart is good medicine. I want you to watch the screens and see if that doesn't bring a smile to your face. It's coming.
Oh, we're not done. We're not done. These are children eating lemons. I could go on. We have a lot of these. And every, almost, almost every parent in this room has done that. You've given your children a lemon, and maybe you didn't give it to them, but they just reached out and got one. Here's what is amazing to me, and I think there's, some, I think there's something to learn here. There are, in fact, some of the clips that I ran across that I w wasn't able to show. The children will take the lemon, put it in their mouth, bite on it, get their face all screwed up, and then put it back in their mouth and do it again. <laughs> but isn't that kind of human nature sometimes? Yeah. That, that we will have something in our life that is distasteful and we'll go right back to it again. Let's be people who learn, like that one little girl, she put it down, <laughs> put it down. There are things that can alleviate. Laughter, joy will alleviate stress from your life. And I, I, think, I think it's important. And I'll just tell you, if you can watch that baby laugh and not at least even smile, your smiler is broken. And you need to go get it fixed real quick. Just something about a baby's laughter that is so innocent and, and just their whole being goes into that laughter. It, it really probably shouldn't be this way, but, but it is. There are some people that I know that the minute I see them, I get filled with stress. Hey, nobody in this church I saw somebody over here going, it's that person over there, it's them. No, nobody in this church. I'm not talking about anybody here. But you know people like that. I mean, they, they just walk into your life and you just, ah. Oh. <laughs> God help us not to be one of those kind of people. Just fill our life with stress. And I'm sure they don't do it intentionally. Some people just carry the stress as their possession. They possess stress. But I'm going to encourage you this. Be the one who brings out the best in people, not the stress in people. Be, be committed to bringing out the best. And I think you would agree with me that, that our lives have a great capacity for stress and that we weren't created to live under stress. You know, when Adam and Eve were created, placed in the garden, there was no stress in the garden. No stress at all. I don't think our physical being was created, divinely created by God, to endure, face, or even deal with stress. And that's why stress can be debilitating in our life. It can affect our physical life, our emotional life, our relational life, if we don't place it in check. And sometimes we have stress that we bring on ourselves. Sometimes it's because we focus on improving our lifestyle rather than improving our lives. We're more concerned about the things that we have or owned than the person that we are. Years ago, it was during a birthday or, or um, a birthday or a pastor's appreciation or maybe just a day, somebody came up to me and they said, I have a gift for you, pastor. And I, you know, I, I love gifts and, and, and they handed it to me, it was a baseball cap. And I, from, from, a little, from a little guy, I wear hats. I always have worn hats all my life, I love hats. When I was little, I wore a cowboy hat. In fact, I, my dad and mother gave me a, a cowboy suit, a cowboy suit. And I wore that suit, and they would literally have to take it away from me while I was asleep to wash it and clean it, because I wore it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But it had a cowboy hat. In fact, I've got a picture of my dad and I with me with that, uh, with that uniform on. Um, but I love hats. But, but on this cap, it had a message. I love caps with messages most of the time. But this message said, too blessed to be stressed. I'm too blessed to be stressed. Now, I don't know whether they gave that cap because they thought I was stressed out. I don't know what the reason was. It, but but I, I love that, that, those words. I'm too blessed to be stressed. I want you to say it with me. I'm too blessed. To be say it again. I'm too blessed to be stressed. I believe that's a statement of faith. I am too blessed to be stressed. And I can guarantee you, you have more blessings in your life than you have stress, stress generators in your life. 
You've got more blessings than you have stress in your life. And so we want to deal with, with how to move the mountain of stress. And, and I'll share with you, this is the principle. And then I have three points to make this morning in the short time that I have. The principle for moving the mountain of stress, and that is this. Praise it off. Praise it off. Say it with me. Praise it off. And I've said it for a reason. I've turned it that way for a reason. Praise it off. Say it again. Praise it off. When I was, when I was young, I, I played football. I played basketball. I played sports. And so, um, and, and by the way, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. I, I, I played sports. And I had a coach. Do you, I'm not going to ask if there are any coaches in the room, but coaches can be some of the harshest people on the face of the earth. I had a coach, and, and you could have two broken legs, somebody, a linebacker, could have ripped your arm off and it's hanging by a thin piece of skin, not being able to see out of both of your eyes, big old giant knot on the top of your head, and his response was always the same, walk it off, walk it off. Coach, I can't walk it off, I don't have any legs. Walk it off. That was, his, that was his, for everything. It didn't matter. Walk it off. I remember one time I was playing football and I, I played receiver, wide receiver, and, and I, 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 they called the play, they passed it to me, I caught the ball and I kept it, back in the day we called it our bread basket, but I kept it in, in my stomach area like this and a big old 300 pound linebacker jumped on me, tackled me, and not only did he tackle me, he fell on top of me and I had the football right in my stomach. Well, it knocked the wind out of me. Only, I didn't know that's what happened. I had never had the wind knocked out of me before. When the wind is knocked out of you, you can't catch your breath. I'm laying on the ground thinking, I am dying. Jesus, I'm about to come home. <laughs> on a football field with a helmet on. And I'm, uh, uh, uh. I can't get, there's no breath in my lung, can't get any breath, and I think I'm dying. Coach runs out on the field, this is a football game, runs, stands are filled with people, or at least that's the way I remember it, and he runs out on the field, and, and, and I'm, at this point, I'm, I'm, I laid on my back, and I'm looking up, just, ah, ah, ah. he runs on the field, and he flips me over, and I'm thinking, what in the, he's going to tell me to walk it off flips me over and grabs me by the belt, by the, by the pants waist, and lifts me up off the ground. I'm, I'm like this. <laughs> well, apparently that's what you do to people who've, <laughs> who have the wind knocked out of them. But that's what he'd do. He would say, walk it off. Walk it off. You'd be in practice, and, and literally you'd be in massive amount of pains, and his answer for everything was just walk it off. Well, I want to tell you this morning, you don't have to walk it off. When you're filled with stress today, I want to encourage you, praise it off. You don't have to walk it off, praise it off. And it works in every single circumstance. Now, on the football field, it didn't always help. I still had a limp, still hurt, the leg was still broken or, or detached from my body or whatever it was. But when you praise it off, something is going to happen. When we begin to praise God, something is going to happen. It's not it might happen, or it could happen, or there's a potential for something happening. When you praise God, something is going to happen. So when you face the spirit of heaviness, praise it off. When you face worry or anxiety, praise it off. When you are discouraged, you are at the depth of discouragement or, or depression, don't give in to it, praise it off. So when problems overwhelm you, when circumstances spin out of your control, when everything seems to be falling apart, I got a word for you this morning. Praise it off to the top of your lungs, to the voice that God has given to you. Read with me Psalms chapter 150, and I love the psalmist. In fact, a theme throughout the psalm are these words, praise the Lord. From the beginning of the Psalms to the end of the Psalms, you will see these same words being spoken again and again and again. It's an admonition. It's a commandment. Praise the Lord. Say it with me. Praise the Lord. And he begins in Psalm 150, reading from the New Century Version. He says, praise the Lord. Now, he wasn't saying in a casual way. In fact, in this translation, it says it has an exclamation point, which means there is, there is passion behind the words. 
There is an emphasis of the words. It wasn't praise the Lord. It was praise the Lord. Now, how many of you know you have something to praise the Lord for? You have something to praise God about in your life. Praise the Lord. Then he says, praise God in his temple. But let me tell you something. Often we think about temple as being this building. So when we come together, and we have this morning, we've come together, we've praised God as we ought, as we should. But I don't think that's what the psalmist was intending to promote in this scripture. He wasn't talking about this temple. He was talking about this temple. Praise the Lord. In fact, I'm not sure we can be the type of praisers that glorify God here if first we don't start here. If it doesn't emanate from the very depth of our soul, of our heart, of our spirit. And then he says, praise God in his temple and praise him in his mighty heavens. In other words, not only praise him in the heavenlies, but praise him under the heavens. So that everywhere you go, it is appropriate and right to praise God. And you can be at work, you can be surrounded by 15 millionaires. You can be in the office of the President of the United States. And you can still be praising the Lord. In fact, I can just guarantee if I'm in the President of the United States, I am praising the Lord. It doesn't mean that we have to be overt, outward in that praise, though we might. How many times, you know, when, 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 when some phrases become uh, uh, commonplace in your life, just the natural response, uh, sometimes you say it at what would be considered an inappropriate time or inconvenient time. I cannot tell you the number of times that I've, I've been with people and as I'm walking away in a store or, or a department store or something, I say, I, I say God bless you. I, 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 don't, I don't even say that consciously sometimes. It's just I say it because that's in my spirit. The Bible says whatever is in here is going to come out. It will come out as words. It will come out as thoughts. But it's going to come out of our heart. And so the scripture says, praise the Lord. That's the commandment with passion, but also praise the Lord in the temple, the temple of the Spirit. Daily, wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, praise the Lord. And then when I gather together with my brothers and sisters in the Lord, then I have an even greater impetus to praise the Lord because now it's not an individual song. It's a collective harmony of the body of Christ praising the Lord. Then it says in verse 2, praise Him for His strength and praise Him for His greatness. Now, Praising him for his strength and his greatness is not praising him for what he has done for you. Years ago, I was praying, and I'm sure there was many, many heartfelt petitions that I was bringing before the Lord, and right in the middle of that, of that prayer time, the Holy Spirit said, Stop. Stop seeking my hand and begin to seek my face. So when we talk about praise, we're not praising God for what he has done only. In fact, I would suggest not even praising God primarily for what he has done for us, though that's appropriate, but praising him for who he is. In other words, not seeking his hand, but seeking his face, seeking his presence. Then he says in verse 3, praise him with a trumpet blast. Praise him with the harps and the lyres. Praise him with the tambourines and dancing. How I wish I could praise God with a dance. All of the dance DNA has been removed from my body. Oh. <laughs> there have been times at, at, at Pat Church, Don and I were pastoring Memorial West. There was a time I was in the sanctuary doing my, my job. I, on Wednesday nights, I vacuumed the, vacuumed the sanctuary. And I was vacuuming the sanctuary, and the Holy Spirit said, I want you to dance. And I said, where'd that come from? I want you to dance before the Lord. I want you to rejoice before the Lord. And I said, I can't. The Holy Spirit said, I didn't tell you you can't. I didn't give you an option. I said, dance before the Lord. And so I searched through the whole church to make sure nobody was there, could be watching. I turned on some music, and I began to dance. And brother and sister, it was not pretty. But I didn't dance for somebody. I danced for the Lord. With the tambourines and dancing. Praise him with the string instruments and the flutes. Praise him with the loud cymbals and with the crashing cymbals. In other words, with, without intimidation, without limitation, without care of what anybody thinks. Let everything, we, we repeat this so many times, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. And then he ends as he began with a commandment with passion. Praise the Lord. Now when you talk about 
praise God with the instruments. When I was growing up, I played the piano. Five years of piano lessons, five years. And uh, to this day, I can't play a thing, can't play a lick on the piano. Because when I got to a certain age, I wanted to play football. And so I went to my mother and I told her, Dad already knew and he was all happy about that. I went to my mother and said, I want to, I want to play football. She said, you can't play football. I said, but I want to play football. She said, you can't play put football and play the piano at the same time. Now, obviously, I'm not on the football field playing the piano. That's not what she meant. You can't do those things together. And, and, and she, said, she said, you have to choose. Well, that was a mistake. That, parents, that was a mistake. You have to choose. And so she said, I want you to pray about it. Pfft, I didn't have to pray about it. <laughs> Mother, I would have to practice for an hour every day, an hour every day day for an hour and we had one of those old old timey um, uh, uh, things where you you turn it and you go click, 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 and then when you hit it go ding and so a timer we called it the timer and she would set the timer for an hour and I'd start practicing ding 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 and she'd walk away and I'd go ding 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 and I'd flip that thing <laughs> 15 minutes and I'd keep playing ding 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 ding, ding. And then in a little while, I'd flip it back 15 more minutes, ding, da, ding, da, ding, da, ding, and then 15 more. And so I ended up practicing for about 20 minutes, and it'd go ding, and mother would come in and she'd say, wow, that hour went by fast. I said, yeah, time goes by fast when you're having fun. But she said to me, she said, you can't do both. And so, and then when I made the decision, she said, you're going to regret this one day, and do you know what? I do. My football career ended a long time ago. But if I'd have stayed with the piano, I would have that gift to this day. Fast forward to my grandson, Caleb, who, by the way, last week turned 18 years old. 18 years old. My grandson, 18 years old, graduates this year. Anyway, he was playing the trumpet, and he was good. Good. I mean good. And he wanted to play basketball. And so he came to me and said, Papa, I want to give up the trumpet to play basketball. I said, you don't have to do, you don't have to give up the trumpet to play basketball. You can do both. See, I learned from my mother. You can do both. And, and at, at the school he was at, you could be in the band and play basketball also. You can do both, Caleb. Just stay with the, stay with the trumpet, do both. No, I don't want to play the trumpet anymore. And, it, and of course, it was his decision, his choice. And so I said, that's fine. But I also said, one of these days, you're going to regret that decision. Now, he hasn't regretted it yet, but one of these days he's going to come to me and he's going to say, Papa, I regret giving up the trumpet. And I'm going to say, I told you so. <laughs> All of these things command us to praise the Lord. Now, in, in just the next few moments, with brief, brief thoughts, I want to give you three things that happen when we praise God. You see, praise defeats stress. If you read 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 21 and 22, and I'm not going to read it for sake of time, but it talks about King Jehoshaphat, and God gave him a strategy to fight against the enemies that were coming against Judah. And the strategy was this. Recruit praise team, recruit musicians to go in front of the army against the enemy. Now just think about that. Think about that strategy. Think about what would happen if President Trump gathered his, his, his generals to his, to his side, says, we've declared war on what, name the nation, and, and we're going to attack them, and rather than the army going with all of the weaponry and all of the, 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 the technicality that we have, we're going to have people, we're going to have a choir, and the choir is going to go before the army, and, and musicians are going to play, the army band is going to play, and, and we're going to march against the enemy. Man, they would impeach him that fast. Seriously, well, they wouldn't have to impeach him. they put him in a little room, you know, a little padded room. They'd think you'd lost your mind, but that's exact strategy that God gave to Jehoshaphat. And the Bible tells us, if you go on with the story, that that's exactly what Jehoshaphat did. I want you to think for a moment. If you were one of the people in Judah and the king came to you and said, uh, we need a choir. Oh, I love to sing. I'll be in the choir. Oh, and by the way, you're going to be in front of the army. No, no, king, you mean behind the army? No, I mean in front of the army. So that the first thing the enemy sees and the first thing the enemy hears is praise to God. In fact, he tells us what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. Don't you know when the enemy heard those words, it messed them up. In fact, it did mess them up so that they ran away. 
Well, you've got to figure, if that army is so weird that they send out singers to come against us, we better get out of here because they're, they're in. Well, you know the story. And the enemy was defeated. And here's a principle that we need to know and gain, gain in our heart. Praise pushes back darkness that surrounds us. Praise will push back darkness that surrounds us. You see, praise blocks the attacks that are against us. And not only that, but when we praise God, stress cannot fasten itself to our lives. I was watching a program, I think it was on the Discovery Channel or National Geographic, and it was about whales, these great humpback whales that would breach the water, they come out of the water, and then they'd go back into the water, splash back in, and they were people on boats taking pictures and videos of this. And there was one thing that I noticed, that when that whale breached the water in their, I don't know whether you call them fins or whatever they're called, came out of the water, you know there was something that was real dark and, 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 and uh, uh, bold on their on fins or whatever that is. What I discovered, it, it's barnacles. That, that if you have a boat and you've ever kept it in fresh water where it didn't come out of the water, eventually you're going to have to scrape the bottom of the boat because barnacles will attach themselves to the bottom of the boat along with some other uh, creatures, attach themselves, and on the bottom of a boat as those uh, barnacles are attached, it, it inhibits, it creates friction in the water that inhibits the, the, um, the, the traveling of that boat, the speed of the boat. Stress will do the same thing to you. If you allow stress to attach itself to your life, it will slow you down. And it will attach itself. But praise does not allow stress to attach itself or fasten itself into our lives. How many battles we fight needlessly, we draw our swords of worry, our shields of fear, and our words of war when all we need to do is just praise God. There's so many fights you don't have to fight. So many battles that have already been won and all we need to do is just begin to praise God. Psalms chapter 149 verse 9 says, A praise-filled warrior will enforce the judgment doom decree against their enemy. A praise-filled warrior will enforce the judgment decree against their enemies. This is the glorious honor that he gives to all of his godly lovers. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. So here's what praise does. Number one, it defeats stress. Praise defeats stress. Secondly, we discover that praise, and this is so important, praise shifts the focus. Let me put it to you another way. Fra praise shifts the balance of power. You see, when you focus on stress, when you focus on the problem, when you exclusively look on what is causing the, the consternation of your spirit or the difficulty of your life, when you focus on that, you give it power. You give it authority. You, you give it life. So that there are people, literally, that have taken, taken ownership of the very things that God said He has liberated us from. It becomes theirs, their possession. They become so comfortable with stress that they wouldn't know what to do if the stress was gone. That is not God's intent. And when we begin to praise Him, we cease to focus on what was the problem and we begin to focus on the answer to the problem. It shifts the power, the balance of power. Psalms 123, 1, and this is an anthem throughout Scripture. I lift up my eyes to you, God, to you who sit enthroned in heaven. In other words, he's saying, I take my eyes off of the problem, off of what is creating stress, and I lift up my eyes to see the Lord. And when that happens, the balance of power has shifted. You have given authority in your life to God's word. You have aligned yourself with what God has said regarding the things that you are dealing with in your life. That word enthroned literally means authority or influence and power. And when we only focus on the problem, which is the fleshly thing to do, we intellectualize it, we worry about it, we study, and nowadays we go to the internet and we will research all of the problems and intricacies. You know, nowadays when you get a new medication, you, you get something from the pharmacist that tells you all of the um, uh, side effects all of the side effects of that, of that medication. 
those side effects will scare you to death. You know, you take a medication because you got a little bit of a headache and all of a sudden you've lost the feeling in your leg. You, all the hair falls out of your head and you don't know why. You are giving, when you focus on the, on the problem, focus on what creates stress, you're giving authority to that. But when you focus on God, you're receiving His authority over that issue in your life. You are shifting the balance. That word enthroned also means to assign value. Isn't that interesting? To assign value. And, and when we are focused on the issues and problems of our life, primarily we are giving value to those things. In essence, what we're saying is that's more valuable to me than God is. Now, no one would intellectually assent to that, but that'd be the reality. I, I, I have more faith in my problem. I have more faith in what I see, and I have more faith in what I cannot change than I have in God. And the minute you begin to praise Him, the minute the words come out of your mouth, not only does it shift the balance of power, it changes your heart, it changes your spirit, it changes everything about you. For once you were hopeless, now you have the greatest of hope. Once you were in despair, now you've got a solid faith that sustains you. And then thirdly, praise releases God's power. Praise, I, I've said it this way many times, and I believe this, that when we begin to praise God, God stands up. And he stands up not because he doesn't lie his throne and not because when he stands up, he's not enthroned, but he stands up because we are praising God. We are giving God our best. And listen, when God stands up, something is going to happen. When God arises, something is going to happen. We find in Acts chapter 16, I'm not going to read it, but it's Paul and Silas are in prison. And not only they're in prison, they've been beaten. Not only have they been beaten, but they've been put in chains. Not only have they been beaten and put in chains, they've been put in stocks. And not only have they been beaten, put, beaten, put in chains and put in stocks, they're in the bottom part of the dungeon. They're with the worst of the worst of humanity. And they didn't do anything. They did nothing wrong. Nothing to deserve this. And so what do they do? They do what we do. We begin complaining and griping. Oh God, why did you let this happen to me? God, I didn't do anything wrong. Why am I here? No, that's not what Paul and Silas did. The Bible says they begin to pray and sing hymns. What do they do? They begin to pray and praise God. Well, were they praising God for the beating? No. Were they praising God for the chains? No. Were they praising God for the stocks? No. Were they praising God for the depth of the prison? No. They were praising God because He was still God. And when you're in the bottom of the pit, He is still God. When you're in the darkness of despair, He is still God. When everyone has turned their back on you, He is still God. And when you begin to praise Him, it releases His power. Uh, we said before, he's faithful. He's loyal. God is loyal. He doesn't see his children getting beaten up without standing up to do something. And with this, they begin to praise. They begin to praise God. What happened? The Bible says the earth began to shake. I'm going to tell you something. God will not even hold the earth back from your needs if it will resolve your problems. The earth began to shake. Not only did the earth shake, but the prison doors flew open. And not only did the earth shake and the prison, do prison doors flew open, but the chains and the stocks were released. And not only from them, but from every one of the prisoners in that prison. Now what would happen in Harris County Jail if there was an earthquake and all of the prison doors just opened? Man, there wouldn't be a prisoner left in that jailhouse. But not a one of them left here. Do you know why? Because the glory of the Lord was in that prison. And why was the glory of the Lord in that prison? Because they opened their mouth. They didn't just think this praise. They opened their mouth and they spoke their praise to God. And the prisoners around them, the Bible says, were listening to what they were saying. And I can tell you, when you begin to praise God, the foundations begin to shake. The foundations of your problem begin to shake in the presence of God. And the doors that hold you in, that keep you captive, those doors will fly open in the name of Jesus. And the chains that keep you in bondage, those chains will drop as we begin to praise the Lord. You see, the natural instinct is probably not to praise God in the times of greatest stress, but it's what God is calling us to do. Praise God. The Lord. Say it with me. Praise the Lord. And the psalmist began it with those words and he ended with the same words, praise the Lord. You see, 
Charles Spurgeon said, we have plenty of troubles and trials. And if we like to fret over them, we can always do that. However, we have far more joys than troubles. And our song should exceed our size. We have a good God who has promised that as our days, so shall our strength be. You see, when you enter into that time of the depth of stress, I have a word for you this morning. Praise it off. Don't wallow in it. Don't sink into it. Don't be held captive by it, but begin to praise it off. Praise defeats stress. Praise shifts the balance of power. And praise releases God's power in your life. So praise it off. When you face the spirit of heaviness, praise it off. When you face worry that you have no control over, praise it off. When you face anxiety that comes because of the stimulus around you, what do you do? Praise it off. And when you're facing discouragement and depression, what do you do? Do you give in to it? No. Here's what you do. You praise it off. Praise the Lord. I want to invite Pastor James, the praise team, and the and the uh, musicians that come, because, you know, we can talk about a lot of stuff. You know, there's principles of the Word that, that after, after you hear the teaching or the preaching, you got to go and you got to let it sink into your spirit. you got to chew on it a little bit. you got to meditate on it. But this is not something we, we need to meditate on. This is something we need to rehearse and practice. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. And if you're filled with stress this morning, we can begin the relief of that stress by giving God praise by honoring Him and blessing Him. Besides, I'm too blessed to be stressed. I'm too blessed to be stressed. So we're going we're gonna to sing. Stand to your feet. Now, now, while we're getting things together and ready, let me say this. The greatest stress reliever in life is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The greatest stress reliever is not being around God. It's being in relationship with God. And, and, and as everything else, God has made that so very easy for us. Simple. Simple. A complicated task made simple through Jesus Christ. If there's sin in your life, if you are prodigal or pilgrim, if, if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, and you know it this morning, I don't have to tap you on the shoulder or no one has to reveal to you. We, we know our condition. We know where we are. But if you're in that place this morning and, and the sin has caused stress in your life, God wants to remove that from you. And it all begins with a simple prayer, a prayer offered with sincerity of heart. And that prayer is this, simple. Father, forgive me of all the sin in my life. As, as Sylvia sang this morning, you, you cast that sea into the sea of forgetfulness. You give it to God and he casts it for you. Forgive me, Lord. And the Bible says he's faithful and just and he will forgive us of all of our sins. All, I love that, I love that word. All of our sins, not the big things or just the small things, but every sin I've committed and he removes it from my life. And I can tell you this, you don't have to give up a habit before you come to God. You don't have to join a church before you come to God. You don't have to pay anything before you come to God. You come to him just the way you are. If your life is messed up, that's the way you come to him. If you're confused, that's the way you come to him. If you're angry, that's the way you come to him. And the Bible says he will accept you just the way you are. Just the way you are. But know this, he will never leave you the way that he finds you. Every time you come to the Lord, he will release the sin, the pain, the anguish from your life. And so you pray a simple prayer. Here's the prayer. Father, forgive me of every sin I've ever committed. Forgive me of all of the wrong I've done in my life. And Father, don't just forgive me. Change my life. Change me. And the Bible says that he'll do that very thing. The beginning. And that prayer is not the end. It's the beginning. It's, it's walking through the threshold of a brand new life. The Bible says the old is gone. The new has come. The sin is removed from our lives. And we have a brand new beginning. Not a, not a new chapter in an old book but a brand new book, a brand new life. God has called that to you. And if, if you desire, pray that prayer right now. Father, forgive me. I need you in my life. Forgive me and change my life. And God will begin that process today and he will see you through every single day. The Bible says he'll never leave you or forsake you. 
He is faithful. He is loyal. He will never abandon you. You may fail. You may stumble. You may fall. But God will be right there with you. And any time you stumble or fall, any time you fail after you've made that commitment, you just reach up to God and say, Father, forgive me and change me. And the Bible says God will take you and lift you up and set your feet upon a solid rock. That's God's heart. It's God's vision. I, I, we're going to end the service with this song. I'm going to ask the, those with altar ministry assignments to come to the front because there may be someone here who wants to pray that prayer to be forgiven of sin and you just need somebody to, to agree with you. You just need, you just need Jesus with skin on. And, and, and we, are, we are here to do that, to pray with you, knowing that we don't, we don't accomplish anything for you. We simply lead you to Jesus and it's he who does the work. And, and I, I, I want to encourage you. We're going to sing this song, and it's going to be the anthem. What is the name of the song? Lord, You Are Awesome. What an appropriate song. A song of praise. And we talk about praise, but we're going to do it. We're going to experience and rehearse that praise and know that as we praise the Lord, as we leave or come forward for prayer, that stress is dropping off in the name of Jesus. That stress is falling off of your life, not only here in this service, but as you go to your homes, it drops off. The prison, the, 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 the foundation is shaken, the doors are open, and the chains are gone, and you are free in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord God, that you have created these, these bodies, you created these spirits, but you never created it to live under stress. You are the stress reliever, releaser. And so, Father, we're going to praise you. And as we praise you, Heavenly Father, we will have that assurance that, 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 that stress will be defeated. We have that assurance that the balance of power begins to shift. We have that assurance that your power will be revealed in our life. So, Father, receive our praise. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's sing it together and sing it as we are released this morning.